along Queen Street. And for Singley and myself, you know, we were uh, sharing a studio at the National Design Center, which is just down the road from here. So this is, you know, part of our, our immediate neighborhood. And what we wanted to do with this mural is to unpack some of the different stories, some of the different kinds of histories that surround the space. So whether it comes in the form of, you know, the different, um, different types of architecture, there are different kinds of public spaces, how people interact with it. But at the same time, you know, we also wanted to explore this meeting, this interaction point of man and nature. So over on the right side of the scene, you, you witness kind of uh, the city, kind of nature coming back. How, oops. Oh, sorry. I think the image is not loading properly. Let me just, let me just, Check again. Okay, can we all see the picture right now? Brilliant. Thanks. Darryl. Okay, okay, great. Sorry. Sorry about that. So, you know, so this is the mural again for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it. So, I'll be sharing a link very shortly and uh, where you can have, you know, take as much time as you want to kind of zoom in to explore all the different hidden details. And there are 168 different species of animals uh, that we've hidden inside the mural over here. So once again, so this mural, what's, what's really uh, unique about it is that we wanted to capture the different narratives that existed, historical, natural, cultural, and how all of these, you know, come together, how they lay upon each other, how they build upon each other. And we're not exactly kind of making a, con giving any conclusion about what it is, but we're giving, um, you know, each and every one of you the chance to create your own uh, interpretation, to see how you understand it. And we'd love to hear, you know, some of uh, what you think about you know, whether we've made any historical inaccuracies, whether we've displayed anything, depicted anything wrongly, we'd love to have this conversation with anyone who walks by. So once again, you know, as we witness, you know, more and more encounters between man and nature recently, so much like the hornbills, the wild boars and the otters that kind of fill the news right now. I think it's ever more important to explore this connection that we have with nature. And I've got two wonderful speakers. So once again, Dr. Young and Robert will be sharing a little bit more about that. So before we begin, I'm just going to, uh, let me see, show you a little bit about what the website is like. So this is un an unnatural history, which you can access at unnaturalhistory.sg, where you can just zoom in, kind of see if you can spot any kind of hidden details. And Singly has uh, added lots and lots of different kind of Easter eggs along the way. So I think, you know, um, you have a great time kind of seeing whether you can spot um, some of the things that we've uh, hidden along the way. And at the same time, you can also kind of click around. So uh, on the Discover page, you know, some of the different buildings that we've included or the different animals and they're all over here. And again, you know, see how many you can spot. How many species are there inside? So we've got 168 here. So um, over the, all the different kind of uh, different families. So some of them, lots of different birds, especially. So I think that's something that Dingley will really, really enjoy. Okay, yeah. let me just switch back to the... I didn't realize you have a list of all these species on the mural. And then if I have anything wrong, you can always let me know as well. Yeah, I think we can go there for bird watching next time. Just stand around there and see how many species you can spot, yeah. I've, I've seen it a couple of times. I mm. thought it looked brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's something we should be doing because we haven't had the chance to actually go there and, and kind of um, search for each of the yeah, 168. So, okay, I'm going to... Um, I don't want to hold uh, all of you back because we, you know, I want to hear from Robert and Tingli. And so some details about the website so you can access it over here. And uh, just a little bit of a plug, you know, for the programs that are coming up. So next week, we have uh, Dr. Lai with uh, Singli. And after that, you know, we'll be having part two of this conversation over here. So today it says art, it doesn't equal to science. And the next one that we're having is uh, where art kind of equals to science. And before we round off on the 29th of May with Dr. Yo and Singli once again. So if you scan the QR code over here, you have a few more details about how you can sign up for the talk and also find out a little bit more about what we're going to be talking about during the different sessions. Okay, so let me introduce our wonderful speakers. So, you know, I've had the privilege of knowing and working with uh, Ding Li and Robert quite, for quite a few years now, and they're both great influences when it came to the mural. So both in terms of, in terms of uh, technical advice, you know, what kind of species, how can I portray them? How am I going to show something that's quite natural? But at the same time, um, you know, just advice on how to kind of uh, 
explore the different forms of narratives. So you know what, they both have their areas of expertise. I don't think Lee shared a little bit about the history and Robert um, about the, you know, how we can think about this, this interaction point between nature and man. So I've also uh, participated in the Parrot Council. This is a citizen science project with both of them. And where we went to somewhere in Clamondy and we kind of, um, what we had to do is just look at, monitor the urban populations count. And this gives us a better understanding of, you know, uh, the native parrots in Singapore. So I think many people always imagine that when you see parrots, it's something that's been released uh, from cages, um, you know, from different pet shops all around. But what we don't really know is that there are many native species of parrots. And also another thing that we participated in recently is the Singapore bird race. So this is a uh, competitive uh, bird watching experience where, you know, you spot as many species as possible during a set amount of time. So I'll pass it on to uh, Ding Li first to introduce themselves, their collaborations, and before we get into the conversation and the dialogue properly after that. Okay, Ding Li, please. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, thanks for uh, having us on this uh, uh, sharing session. And I want to think of it more as a conversation between the, the three of us, you know, in terms of how uh, our collective experiences have, you know, come together to result in some of these works we have here. Yeah, and uh, I, I think uh, before I start, I also want to I want to co congratulate you and Sing Lee for putting this uh, this wonderful mural together. Uh, I'm, I've been lucky to visit it on three occasions and uh, I spent each time about 30 minutes there, you know, staring at the mural and trying to uh, imbibe all the different elements of the mural. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great juxtaposition of, of nature and wildlife at the same time. And of course, for those of us who are very interested in the different species, a lot of nature lovers are interested in the different species. We could probably spend a long time there looking at different birds, mammals that you have portrayed there. So um, well done and congratulations on this. Uh, one of the you know finest murals in this part of Singapore that we can uh, you know have a look into the past of this country and also the natural history aspects uh, of Singapore. So fantastic work there. Um, I, I'm going to start by sharing a little bit. Um, about my own background, my own inspirations, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I've done in the past, uh, some of which I have uh, well, in fact, many I, I have uh, collaborated with Robert on in the past. And then uh, once I'm done with that, I'm just going to pass the floor around to Robert and Daryl to chime in whenever they have something to, to add on to the conversation. Uh, so at this point, I'm I just want to add something yeah. as well. So the thing you mentioned that you actually do want to take questions along the way. So yeah. if there's anyone in the audience, if you have, if you have anything that you're wondering at all, just kind of ask away and we'll kind of address them during the session. So instead of kind of waiting to the end, we are just mm. going to kind of respond to it. So much like, much as if we are all in the same room right now and just kind of talking through all these yeah, different ideas. So again, you know, as you kind of type it out in the Q&A, we'll answer it or I'll bring it up for you or Ding Li can, can just respond to it directly as well. I think that sounds so, like- So uh, please idea. remember to use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. Okay, yes, back to you. Sorry okay. about the interruption. No worries, yeah. So so like Darryl, what Daryl uh, mentioned, if you have anything that you want to chime in, just uh, put it into the Q&A box at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I'm going to click on share screen. I hope it works this time. Uh, it should work, okay. So- uh, okay. okay, all good, all yeah. right, okay. Not too laggy, I hope, yeah. So um, I'm gonna share a little bit about my work uh, and my inspiration. Um, and every now and then we're gonna move around, uh, you know, different topics. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, how did I come about, you know, working on nature and nature conservation. Uh, currently I work uh, full-time at the uh, UK-based charity uh, focused on bird conservation, bird and environmental conservation. I've been here for quite a while. Uh, and uh, in my job, I do a lot of work trying to, you know, understand uh, the, uh, the ecological needs of migratory species and how we can better protect them. But where did my journey start? Well, it actually goes back quite a long way uh, and through a bunch of totally serendipitous events, you know. Uh, of course, when I was young, I was really very interested in, in the portrayal and representation of uh, people, nature and cities. So I remember when I was growing up, uh, you know, in, in Singapore, in Kuala Lumpur, I spent a lot of my time scribbling lots of doodling uh, on mahjong paper, you know, drawing entire cities, rainforests. I've got that obsession with diversity and complexity. Uh, but I was never uh, really interested in nature those days. I don't have that particular interest in wanting to look at nature. And I think it was a purely um, 
incidental event, you know, back, when I was back in primary school where I uh, stumbled upon some bird species when I was in school that I couldn't figure out what they were. And um, those uh, observations, those early exposures got me kind of interested in, in, in birds. So I, I went to the library more often. I spent a lot of my pocket money buying these nature books. Those days, there were not that many books available. I think many of us who like nature, we grew up with this series of books called the Science Center Guides. Um, in uh, 1995, they cost $5.15. So that's quite a sum still for a, a primary school kid. But I bought uh, quite a few of them and uh, they were early exposures to me, for me for, uh, to look at nature. Uh, and then um, in 1995, I, I uh, accidentally discovered that there were actually a bunch of nature lovers in Singapore who have been doing this for a long time, you know, for decades. And uh, these are none other than our colleagues from the Nature Society of Singapore. Uh, I joined the Nature Study of Singapore, and that's where I got more and more exposure. I learned that, uh, you know, through all these decades of uh, nature walks and uh, talks that I've joined, uh, that uh, even though then there were not that many uh, resources or material we have for, uh, you know, understanding our own uh, biodiversity, um, a lot of new knowledge for me came through uh, the experiences of other experts, many of who are still my friend right now. Uh, so I tried my best to merge my two interests in nature and in uh, a drawing. And of course, that has kind of taken me a long way forward since then. Uh, of course, moving forward, uh, I had to go to university, as many of us would have to. Uh, and this was where I you know, wanted to pursue an interest uh, more professionally in, 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 uh, in nature and ecology. Uh, I studied at the National University of Singapore, where uh, during my, uh, you know, my, my, my final year, I had this uh, ex ex extremely uh, intense experience of being sent by my professor then to the jungles of Malaysia. So I went to Malaysia with a bunch of binoculars, gadgets for looking at insects and birds. And uh, I spent many, many weeks in the jungles of Malaysia, which of course, again, kind of influenced the way I think about nature. Uh, I also went on to spend a lot of field time in the, in the forests of Indonesia, in the high mountains of Indonesia. Uh, and collectively, I, I would say that these experiences have kind of shaped the way, uh, you know, I think about nature. Um, and then, to, you know, back in about uh, 2016, 2017, um, I again, once again, stumbled upon an opportunity to work on nature, to work to conserve nature. And I started joining, I, I, I started uh, thinking about this things more seriously. Uh, I, I, I worked for a uh, uh, I started working for BirdLife International, which I'm with right now, and uh, that has uh, taken me into more different experiences and spaces to look at nature. Uh, a little bit about the picture on the on the right side of my slide. Um, this is a picture that two of us speakers are actually on the same slide. Uh, this was taken from a trip that uh, Robert and I made to China in 2019. Uh, I think that was in Yalujiang, in the, well, the area near to the Chinese North Korean border. And this area was very inspiring for me. It was very inspiring for Robert. It kind of influenced some of the work that we did thereafter. Uh, Robert is the person in the middle, and I'm the person on the right-hand side. Uh, and we're here with our colleague, uh, a well-known ornithologist in China, who brought us to this wonderful wetland. There were, I'm sure, there was a uh, two hundred thousand birds on the mudflats. You know, spectacular sights of nature that I don't think I've ever seen since then. Well, partly because of the pandemic, we couldn't go to China to look at birds. Yeah, so. I think that event was very inspiring and um, shaped a lot of my thinking about nature thereafter. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to start by talking about one of my, uh, my, my greatest interests, which is migratory birds and how we can conserve them. So uh, as you kind of expected, the picture that you're seeing on the screen right now was also from the same trip. I made a number of trips to, to China uh, and to Mongolia to look at migratory birds, but I think this was one of the more memorable trips I had. Um, and uh, I think migratory birds uh, are one of the most interesting phenomena of nature. I'm not sure if everybody here agrees, but because it's something that I've consumed so much of my energy in my work and in my interest, I tend to end up spending a lot of time thinking about uh, uh, migratory birds. I think migratory birds also prevent very interesting perspectives. Uh, we, we, we think about nature and biodiversity uh, because, uh, you know, unlike a lot of the species that we see day to day, which are around us all the time, all year round, you know, for example, for those of you who are bird watchers or nature lovers, you probably go around and you see things like Oreos, barbets, parrots outside your window. 
and they are there every day, you know, sometimes they're not there because they've gone somewhere else to feed, you know, but what is really, uh, I find what is really remarkable about migratory birds is the fact that, um, you know, half the time you don't see them and half the time they are here. Uh, there's this very transient element of, you know, uh, of, of migratory birds that, you know, really uh, makes us think a little bit more about, uh, or should I say makes us a bit more uh, wond wondrous about, you know, where are they, you know, where are they right now, they're gone. Uh, and then suddenly they appear, you know, out, you could say out of the blue in the, in the later part of the year and you just wonder where they came from, you know. The other thing that I find particularly amazing about migratory species is that they join uh, places across large distances. Uh, the scale of migration, the, the, the geographical scale of migra migration is fantastic, um, you know. I, I'm not sure if many of you here go and dig into where these migratory birds actually come from, you know, but uh, one of those species that I feel very strongly about is a little brown bird that can be found in many areas of Singapore called the Arctic Wobbler. Um, it's a species that is not heavier than, you know, uh, maybe a, a small stack of paper, about eight, nine grams, tiny little bird, you know, and I know that there's one outside in my car park right now in my office. I heard it this morning, you know, but this bird, uh, I want, I just, I just am amazed at how these birds travel to get to, to Singapore every year. Uh, you know, the, the kinds of forests it has to fly across, this bird lives in Siberia, so to get out of Siberia, it has to fly across so much forest. And then it's got to go through the mountains of China and then down the mountains of uh, Southeast Asia to get to Singapore. So I think that really um, is a re uh, uh, it on its own presents some very uh, amazing perspectives for us in terms of how we think about uh, how we think about nature. Yeah, and I guess I'm lucky in the sense that my work requires me to think more and more about migratory birds because uh, a huge part of my job involves trying to develop ways to protect them across different parts of Asia and also here in Singapore. Uh, migratory birds, a very big part of my job, of course, uh, but uh, I also want to think a lot, uh, think a little bit, I want to bring you a little bit into uh, biodiversity within our, our uh, city. Uh, I know Singapore is not a very big country. We are all confined to a space of about, you know, about not more than 750 kilometers square of land. But, uh, you know, if you look carefully, biodiversity is quite abundant in the city. And I think we all know, uh, you know, from all the documentaries we have watched that, you know, Singapore is very rich in biodiversity. Uh, what is also more amazing, you know, in the last couple of years, last maybe 12 or so months is that people are now made more aware than ever before they are of biodiversity. People are now stuck in their homes because of the pandemic and they look at nature more often. I've gone to many nature areas that in the past, there were not many people around. There were, you know, uh, just a handful of folks walking around looking at nature. But now when you are out in the, in the reserves, it's so crowded, you know, people are out there looking at nature. Um, and then when they do that, it, they just get, you know, astounded by how much there is around us in the city. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this picture. I think this picture is a nice representation of two major themes for uh, wildlife in Singapore. The, the, the bird species that you're seeing in this picture is the red-breasted parakeet. Um, it's not a bird that is originally native to Singapore. This uh, parakeet is actually uh, what you can think of as an alien species. Uh, I don't know how many of us here are familiar with alien species, but these are birds that come from other parts of Southeast Asia. They are now quite common in Singapore. Um, partly because birds escape from people's cages uh, and their populations built up over time. And now they're quite common in certain parts of the city. Um, so two, two themes come across very strongly to me when I look at red-breasted parakeets. One thing I'm really amazed is, is how a species that is not native to this part of the world has become so common. That's one, one theme. And that's a recurrent theme when, that we see when we look at biodiversity in Singapore. Because if you look around the city, there are examples of many plants and animals that are not native to Singapore but uh, they have done very well here. They're quite common. Um, and, you know, you might even see it uh, outside the places that you live right now, you know. This picture was taken from Clementi. There's a huge gathering of these birds in Clementi. And uh, earlier on, Daryl shared about the Parrot Count. The Parrot Count is actually a citizen science initiative that the Nature Society of Singapore does. I work very closely with the Nature Society to monitor biodiversity. And one of these activities that I do regularly is a Parrot Count. And I think on that day that this picture was taken, I was with Robert and Daryl we in Clementi, uh, looking at these parrots gather, you know, after sunset. Uh, amazing observations of, you know, I think there was probably 500 birds on that uh, evening. Uh, and like I say earlier on, they make us think a lot about uh, biodiversity that is not native to Singapore, 
the second thing that make us think a lot about is how you know uh, biodiversity in general, uh, including species that are not native to Singapore, have thrived in this in this uh, so-called urban jungle, so to speak. So uh, native parrots is one thing, uh, and I think I think another example uh, that you know brings across the message of how biodiversity have thrived in Singapore over time is this species that we are all very familiar with right now, the uh, wild pig. I think the wild pig is a very, uh, it's got a bunch of interesting experiences for me uh, and also for Robert, uh, you know, back to the back to those days when we were, you know, exploring Singapore. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you started looking at nature in the 90s. You know? I started bird watching in the 90s, same as Robert. Um, and back in those days, wild pigs were unheard of. Nobody ever thinks about them. Uh, we know that they could be found in places like Pulau Tekong, you know, and sometimes on Pulau Ubin, but they're just not on, you know, the main island of Singapore. And they, back in 2004, I think it was 2004. Robert, is it 2004 where we found that carcass of that wild pig in Sungai Tengah Road? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I remember one day we were cruising along Sungai Tengah Road and then we saw a carcass of a wild pig. Um, piglet. A piglet, yeah, a piglet. Yeah. A bit similar to the one that I have on the picture here. And uh, we were astounded. We went to dig all the books we could uh, on mammals of Singapore then. And it, uh, we were surprised because a lot of the books then said that the pigs were not found on the main island of Singapore. So we, we did a bit more research. Uh, and I think uh, ever since then, that was in 2004, uh, pigs have uh, you know radically uh, increased in numbers. They are more common than ever before. You can see them easily at some places. I think you see them appearing in the news every now and then. Uh, those of you who go for hiking for, to Pulau Ubin, for example, you will see that there's some very, very approachable pigs that uh, you can observe very closely. So how did this wild pig get to Singapore Island? Uh, how have it got, how has it gotten more common in the past? Why? Why has it done so well? These are questions that totally intrigued me. And uh, I think I had many, many more conversations with Robert to not only think about the, the ecology of pigs in general, but also think about how we can represent pigs in uh, discourses exploring the relationship between men and, and nature. Um, and that said, I, I must admit that I have a strong interest in mammals. Um, it's not obviously a big part of my 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 day to day work, but I've always been interested in looking at mammals, uh, primates, for example, uh, partly because of the exposure from some of my friends, uh, as well as uh, rodents, bats, and all that. Yeah. Um, and then building on the theme that I mentioned earlier on about the uh, city, uh, how Singapore city is such a you know a hotbed of biodiversity. I, I the other theme that I, I see a lot in my work is how endangered species, threatened species have uh, survived in the city based on the, the interesting or you could say unusual circumstances of Singapore. This is a news article that the, the Straits Times put up I think more than three years ago uh, looking at how Singapore, yeah, the urban environment of Singapore together with all the little forest patches we have, our central nature reserve have become refuges for two of the most threatened birds in Southeast Asia. Well, technically the long-tailed parakeet is still not that rare, but the straw-headed bobo is one animal that strikes me a lot. It's a bird that I've been working with the Nature Society to try to protect in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are into conservation and are aware of its uh, red list status, conservation status of this bird, this is a bird that is considered by authorities around the world as critically endangered. It's got a very small population at a global level uh, I think the authorities think that there are more than, well, there are no more than 2,000 individuals of straw edible lab in the world. But recent studies are beginning to show that Singapore is quite important for it. In fact, up to a third of the world population is actually in Singapore, even though this species is spread out quite widely in, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Thailand, and Myanmar. Uh, but uh, the circumstances of Singapore has really made uh, unusual, uh, you know, situations uh, on how this species have thrived in, in, uh, in this country. Um, and for those of you who are, you know, uh, knowledgeable about the bird trade, we know that the tribe is one of those species that are very, very in demand by people who keep birds in other parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, they are very heavily hunted, and I don't think there are many places left in the world wild populations of straw edible wolf. So the straw edible wolf presents a very unusual situation uh, for wildlife in Singapore. You know, it's one of those bizarre examples of how a very, very threatened animal is surviving very, very well in, in a small city. Uh, Tingli, Tingli, sorry, yeah. just to ask a question. Uh, is it yep. a native bird? 
Swine bobo uh, is, is, I believe, is a native, but I think we've got records dating back to the 1920s. In fact, uh, I think back in the colonial era, uh, I think two specimens was collected from Pulau Ubin. Uh, now in the, in the uh, our museum, Li Kong Chen Museum of Natural History. So I think from that we can infer that this bird has been indigenous to Singapore. And um and, and have they always been uh, uh, on the increase or there was a decline and then recently we have seen an increase in the population of this species? Uh, I think that's a really good point that you you brought up. Actually, nobody thought about straw-headed bobos um, until the 90s when it became more and more common. I remember when in, in 1994, I visited Bukit Batong Nature Park. I read from other people, from other books from around the region, saying that this is a declining bird then. But it wasn't that rare then. And I was really surprised that it was found in Bukit, places like Bukit Bato. So um, the situation has changed now. Uh, we now know that this bird is very affected by hunting. And I think there's a lot of research that has been done around this part of the world by our colleagues, uh, by myself and some of my uh, close collaborators, um, which shows us that uh, uh, Singapore is really important for species like the Shroida Bobo. Yeah. So I think it's a great story to tell. But the Shroida Bobo is not uh, the only one of these species. One of the other threatened species, or should I say species that is not common in other parts of the world, but it's doing quite well in Singapore, is the gray-headed fish eagle. Uh, it's a very large bird of prey that you can see in the reservoirs. Um, and uh, I remember when I was in primary school, it was very rare to see one was a big deal. I remember I saw one and oh, I was literally jumping for joy. This is back in 1985. But fast forward 25 years, you can find them in many water bodies. And uh, as ecologists, we are trying to understand why, how did such a bird of prey that's so rare in other countries get so common in Singapore? We think we know why. And one of the reasons we are trying to, we're brought up to explain how this bird has survived in this city environment is that we've got all these um, alien fish species in our reservoirs, which are fantastic sources of food for the fish eagles. I think Robert will uh, say a little bit more about the fish eagle later from his exploration of uh, biodiversity in, in Singapore. Uh, and last but not least, I want to also briefly run through this very interesting piece of work that I do in my day-to-day -day job on the wildlife so rethinking, really can I just interrupt you here before we move on? So we've got yep, a question go from Raymond. So it's like, is the straw-headed bobo kept alive because of its popularity as a songbird? So, I, at, mm -hmm. and and uh, if I'm not wrong, that's also one of the birds that we spotted during the bird race, right? Yeah, and what was saw, quite unique about this yeah. straw-headed bobo is that you didn't have to see it visually, unlike most of the other birds, is that we could identify it by its very unique kind of bird song. Yeah, so do you want to uh, yeah, yeah tell us a little bit about that and also maybe uh, some of your work kind of exploring bird sounds as well. Yeah, the Stride Bobo, uh, as Daryl has pointed out, has a fantastic sound. Um, I think some of you may be able to hear that on documentaries and videos. Um, and it's also a very, it's a, it's a one of those sad cases where, you know, you've got a bird that is um, being exploited to the point of extinction for its wonderful song. If you read documentaries and reports here and there, we know that it is, it is very, very sought after for the bird trade in, you know, parts of Indonesia. And for that very reason, people are catching it, you know, left, right, center, until the populations are nearly gone in most Southeast Asia. So literally sold for its song. You know, I think one of the reports by my colleague has this headline, which I think was very compelling and poignant. Uh, and that brings me to one of my great interests also um, that I've not talked a lot about in recording nature sounds. Nature sounds are something that I've discovered um, back in my uh, in days. I accidentally recorded nature sounds because those days I had a very lousy cassette, cassette tape recorder. You know, those little gadgets handheld with uh, where you could put a small tape in. And I, I tried recording a lot of uh, wildlife sounds, not just bird sounds. I was also interested in the sounds made by primates and squirrels and all that. You know, I collected a lot of uh, these sounds back in the days. Um, but then came digital technology, right? And uh, it kind of revolutionized the amount of data we can collect. Um, so back in about 2010, I brought, uh, I, I bought a microphone, a long microphone that allows me to collect, uh, you know, sounds from a particular direction. Um, that year, I think I was sent to Indonesia to do field work. Uh, I was working on bird ecology studies in this island called Sulawesi. So I, I spent a lot of my free time in Sulawesi when I was not really doing field work to record nature sounds. Yeah, I think I got, I, I figured out that, uh, you know, it was quite, um, exciting for me to record nature sounds and it also makes us think about the natural world in very different ways from when we see animals you know on the from a binocular or from a telescope so um, thinking about animal sounds thinking about the environment of sound or what we call soundscapes I feel is very interesting to me 
um, and the kinds of knowledge we can gain from any ecosystem, you know, in terms of environmental sounds, I think is an emerging field nowadays from uh, people working in ecology. So uh, I'm being, paying more and more attention to sound. Uh, and I think in the past couple of years, I've spent a lot of my time actually running around Singapore's nature reserve to, with my microphone to capture nature sounds. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a progression from my interest in bird watching. I started, uh, of course, uh, by looking at animals, but now I'm interested in the sounds and what kinds of uh, information we can get about the, uh, the, the, the environment from these sounds. Yeah. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Daryl. Uh, no, the, the, I think the question is, is the bob, is the booboo cap alive because of his popular, popularity as a songbird? I think he meant alive as in cat, yeah. um, in steady population so it could, levels. I guess it could come in the form of like, yeah, the fact that uh, are appreciating it and they, they are doing some things to keep it alive. Alternatively, I suppose, I mean, a slightly trickier topic that we're talking about, uh, when it comes to the next slide or so, right? As yeah. in, is there perhaps a captive population that allows it to concurrently exist in larger numbers than it was before? Or the question could be, does the song help the bird oh. conservation? I don't think so. I would... Uh, so it's, the, it's more of the numbers than the song, right? Yeah, I think the song uh, of the bird... The song is, actually cause is dismissed. This, this this device. Device. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the song has been a bird's downfall as it has been for many species of birds we know, yeah. Um, of course, we, we know that people can breed stroller bubbles and captivity. Uh, and I'm sure they are doing that in- Is it successful? I am aware it was successful from what I've talked to my, my colleagues. So we know that there are stroller bubbles that are raised in captive uh, collections, but people still catch them from the wild. And like what you have said, Robert, um, the song is really the, the cause of the demise of populations of this bird in many areas in this part of the world. Okay, uh, I think also probably this is the first time a lot of people have heard what a straw header boo boo is, and it's don't you do you think that it's especially weird that um, although Singapore boosts such a stronghold of this species and we kind of should be proud of it, but the main narratives of Singapore conservation doesn't kind of revolve around this nice songbird. Perhaps uh, I don't know what what birds do we think of when we think of Singapore conservation. Um, actually, it's a uh, conservation. We tend to think about it from a habitat point of view. So we right. think about forests. You know, I think it's only in the last few years we are thinking more about species. Uh, we are kind of shifting the narrative of conservation from protecting the forest to species. Uh, another uh, narrative as emerging, you know, from this discourse on conservation of birds is also into the topic of wetlands. I feel that we talk more and more about wetlands in recent years, and I guess climate change kind of bring the wetland part of the conversation into the picture. So okay, it's, so it's a changing it, thing, yeah. We can we can answer one another uh, question by Andre. Mm -hmm. Andre, he said, "What makes Singapore's environment and landscape such a stronghold for species such as the shore-headed bubu? Whereas, um, let's say, for example, maybe our our partner, uh, our neighbors, Indonesia mm -hmm. or Malaysia." Mm. Uh, how, how we are so near, we are so alive, but what what is the difference here that um, that makes all these straw header boo boo a kind of uh, able to thrive here? Or the anomaly, right? Johor. Yeah, yeah, because Johor could be and should be wilder than Singapore, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, that said, uh, that said, uh, I want to uh, draw uh, the audience that uh, our part of the world is actually very rich in species. Mm. Don't get me wrong, Malaysia and Indonesia has fantastic biodiversity. They are considered among the top 10 countries on the planet for biodiversity. There's a lot of wildlife in the two countries. Um, on land, on sea, they've got mountains. They have no mountains. So there's an amazing amount of biodiversity in Malaysia and Indonesia. And I guess I've been lucky. I think like all of us here, we've been lucky for those of us who, who work in, in, you know, in, the, in the region, we've been able to see all this wonderful biodiversity. But Singapore is interesting because uh, we are very urbanized. I think more than half the country is considered as urban now. But within this urban landscape, there's a lot of greenery. Um, and I think uh, kudos to uh, our colleagues in uh, government, which have been working very hard, who have been working very hard to preserve the uh, you know, urban landscape, uh, the urban greenery. Uh, we also shouldn't focus, forget the fact that there are some really uh, interesting areas of forests and wetlands in the country. No doubt they are small in area, but they su su support quite a bit of biodiversity. 
And the fact that we don't have uh, the kinds of conservation issues in our surrounding countries, like people hunting birds, you know, uh, in huge numbers. Mm. I think that, that this picture that I, I, I have here on the screen, this picture was taken from uh, other parts of Southeast Asia. I, I don't know how aware we are of the conservation situation in Southeast Asia, but in many countries in this region, people uh, hunt birds in large numbers for the pet trade, for release, or for food. Uh, we don't have these problems in such a scale here. Um, and I think that makes it really interesting, allowing our biodiversity to thrive. Things like soil things like the parakeets that you have seen in my earlier slide, and, and many other species. Uh, but at the same time, we also have lost quite a number of species in the last 20, 30 years because of the fact that our forests are quite small. Uh, species are not able to survive. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, there's quite a long list of species that have gone extinct in, in our country. Uh, could, could also a lack of natural pre predators in... in um our landscape be a cause of this? Um, I, if, you have, if I had to give a short answer, I would say maybe. I'm not sure. I, I don't have the full answer. But actually, I, I would like to think of the fact that Singapore has a lot of natural predators. Uh, think about the bird predators. There are many kinds of eagles and hawks in the country. But, but we would have a lower kind of threshold for of, uh, mammal and reptilian predators for these birds, no? I think so, but I think, I mean, you told me that there are, you always see eagles from your apartment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but I, I think eagles have specific diets and taste preference and maybe straw-headed bull has not been added to the local raptor menu <laughs> as a kind of a good yeah. food to eat. So I, I don't know, I'm just kind of wondering, speculating, yeah. speculating answers and questions that we, we can think about of, of what, what's unique about uh, the, the species makeup here in Singapore. Uh, actually, we, talking about eagles and raptors, we can move on to your last slide, which is you're showing... Um, uh, can you tell us a bit about this mysterious picture that you're showing us? Yeah, this picture is, uh, is from the Lao Thai border. I visited a market to do a study on the wildlife trade. Um, basically, I was going around to understand what kinds of species are being hunted by people. Um, and this was one of the rather uh, compelling scenes I had. I saw this species. I've actually never seen this species in being kept as a pet, you know, by people before. So I spent a long time looking at this bird. This is the gray-faced buzzard. It's a migratory species, you know. The gray-faced buzzard come from the forests of Japan and Far oh. East Russia. So um, the fact that it's here in, in the Thai Lao border caught in a market ready to be sold, I think uh, really affected me. Um, I spent quite a while looking at this individual. Yeah. But of course, there, there's a lot- And, of and was this something that you saw very often at, at the same time? Is it a unique specimen that, that was spotted because of how rare it is? Or did you actually see very unique, unique species like these being offered all over the place? Um, I think when I did those studies, I saw a lot of species that I never thought were being hunted by people around Southeast Asia. So I thought that was quite, um, it was quite worrying uh, for me. I mean, of course you get a lot of data, but you just see how bad our biodiversity is being impacted, you know, by people taking them out of their wild environment at the, I like to think of it as unsustainable levels. I mean, we don't have a lot of forest left in the region. Um, species are, are in decline everywhere. So every little bit makes it even worse yeah, for biodiversity. Yeah. What, what were you doing in the market? What was it part of? I was doing a wildlife survey of the kind of species that are uh, being hunted. Yeah, It was a survey. Specifically survey. market driven. Yeah, I was running around markets in Southeast Asia, checking out markets and seeing what was being sold. Yeah. How, how many markets do you go to at the end of it? I must have visited at least uh, 10, 20 different markets across different countries of Southeast Asia. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, great. Yeah, but so I think the, the, the studies, okay, from the studies perspective, we know that Southeast Asia is a hotbed of wildlife trade yeah, all over the region. Um, and the wildlife trade is one thing from the conservation point of view, but I think uh, when you think about it, um, it also exposes this very complex relationship between man and nature and how human beings are exploiting nature um, in a way that is detrimental to biodiversity yeah and presents interesting narratives for us to think more about yeah so i i know that robert has prepared some really exciting material for us uh, some blasts from the past as well uh, reflections of some of the collaborations we had uh, i better not hold this up for too long i want to pass the floor to back to robert and uh, if Daryl, you've got anything to add, feel free to chime in as well. But 
I think uh, this. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't want to take up extra time because uh, we'd love to hear from Robert. And also yeah. one more thing, uh, I think we might be overrunning a little bit. So you know, we'll be uh, finishing the presentation by noon when we are slated to end. But we're happy to hang around for a bit more, kind of uh, engaging in conversations and just a lot. Once again, if you've got more questions or you know, if you just want to hear us kind of talk about this, you know, we're still going to be here for a bit after. So I'll pass the time to Robert right now, uh, who will kind of uh, carry on. And, and share some of the collaborations that they explored together. Okay, um, I just like to backtrack a bit. Uh, so with this 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 talk that I'm doing with Ding Li and Daryl will be in two parts. Uh, so next week we'll we'll talk a bit about some of the so next session, not next week. Oh yeah, sorry. Next section, next next session, we'll talk yeah. a, a bit about uh, some of the projects that I actually collaborated with Ding Li about. So today we're just kind of going through. Um, we'll go through some of that as well, but we, it's, it's really talking about ideas and uh, of him as a scientist, as me as an artist, and how we go about looking at things. And so um, we'll, next week, we'll talk specifically also about the Yalu River um, migratory visit that we did together. Um, and okay, so uh, first slide you, you see here is uh, Ting Li. This is when I first met him uh, in 2001. Actually, the, the first time uh, we went out as friends was uh, to this place called Tanamera, um, which is now the I Terminal Four. Huh? Terminal Four. But what was what's this landscape now actually? Changi Airport. No la, is it? Yeah, this is Terminal Four. Oh right, okay. Yeah, I have no idea. Okay, so um, this is uh, and then it, this was when we just graduated um from Sec Four, I think, and he would say that you know where I'm going to um, watch birds and then we we stay in the west and then we drop off at Tanamara and then we begin this long two hour hike in this reclaimed land. That was dreadful man. I remember I hated it. Yeah I mean, we only go on the weekends when most of the trucks are not working. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, actually what, what drove me I, I've been to landscapes like this when twice because my father used to fish when it was still a rec but this one was a bit different because I was looking at it very differently from Ting Li's eyes because he was a, a he was a nature lover and he was on on his way to become a conservationist, and he was looking at things like uh, he was talking about all these marshes that um, this is very unique. He was telling me I remember he was telling me that um, this is a very unique landscape. It's very wide expanse and it's very unique, and um, and and a lot of um, Habitats is task form in that short two or three years when we were visiting that place, right? Yeah, Afri uh, you yeah, we can think of them as very ephemeral kind of habitat. You know, they just show up for 10, uh, five, six years and then they get, you know, bulldozed over and become something else. So can you tell me a bit about what drew you to this landscape back then? I think there were two things uh, that struck me at this landscape. Um, the first thing was um, was that the, um, the explorer in me, you know, I think all of us have these explorer genes. Uh, having discovered that Singapore has so many different species of birds, we were all keen to see new stuff. Um, and I hear from my colleagues back then that, you know, there were some really un uncommon, very rare migratory birds there. So I visited those areas with the high hopes of finding some of these really rare migratory birds. Yeah. One of which, uh, one of the most special moments I had was when we saw in 1999, I think I really knew you by, by 1999. Um, the spoon built sandpiper is one of the rarest migratory birds of Asia or in the world, in fact, you know, I don't think we've seen it ever since then. And uh, this place where I'm standing right in the picture, which you took back then, uh, the, that watery area in front, you can see that wet area in front, right? that was where the spoon built sandpiper appeared. Yeah. The other thing I, I, I was uh, captured by this landscape was the stuck, the starkness, um, you know, this very uh, compelling contrast of. Uh, greenery and barren, barrenness, you know, I find it really remarkable. And I just want to go back to see it again and again, even though it was, it was a hard slog. Uh, I think we, we nearly perished in those walk. I think it was three kilometers to walk from the Halamara Ferry Terminal where the bus dropped us off back into this area and out again. So each time we go to this place, we had to walk six kilometers. It was a lot. It was very hot. Yeah. And, uh, and and for me, I, I, I went with him almost every week. And then for me, I was attracted to the landscape. And of course, the, the stories that he could uncover for me. And the projects were actually based on this reclaimed land, uh, landscape uh, after that. So this is him. And we have to wear boots because just because we have to wade through a lot of extent of all these marshes to just reach the other side. Is that you or me? Uh? Is yes, that, that's still me, is you. you. Yeah. You me. Okay. Okay, this is me. So this is a kind of uh, extent of the large landscape that we have. 
Um, and, and one of the things that I remember from those days was that um, Ding Li actually, so this is from, I got this from Ding Li. Uh, so he, he, when he was very young, he was already kind of uh, spotlighted as a very promising birder. But, but what, what one of the more interesting stories he told me was of a Himalayan vulture he saw in Tana Mera. Um, and then, um, you know, that's him with binoculars looking at uh, the, the voucher. 2006, and, right? 2006. Yeah, 2006. Oh that voucher is huge, man. Yeah, and then I think the voucher was... Uh, and, and, and the story about vouchers, Himalayan vouchers, why they're in Singapore is up for speculation. It's, it's, it's for me, I, I think it's, it's things that um, it's interesting to read, but I, I cannot get my mind over it. I would just keep on thinking and thinking um, and I'm sure Tingli also thinks why. And, and, and for him, it's not just an encounter with uh, something beautiful. It's an encounter of something that must be understood. And we should try to understand um, what, what is the real situation on the context of seeing a Himalayan griffin in reclaimed land of Singapore. Mm. And so this is one of his first papers I heard. So I think for, <laughs> for, for this is when I started to think that as a scientist, Tingli, if you have to be kind of you have to put a lot of things together, a lot of factors together, and then you have to be imaginative. And then you have to think of a reason. And so he speculated reasons of why the Himalayan griffin vulture has been kind of settling over Southeast, the region, Southeast Asia, and especially as far as Singapore. Do they go to Indonesia? Only once, once or ever were they recorded in Indonesia. Yeah, but like what you say about being speculative, I think as scientists, uh, we are trained in a particular tradition of observing collecting that data and trying to make sense of the data using the existing framework theories and things we know from all over the place. So trying to put things in the context uh, and to put that in the context, you need to have bre a breath of knowledge and also be a bit speculative at times and then try to test for those hypotheses. Yeah. And uh, so, so I'm going to the question over here also, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Based on, we're talking about collecting data in different forms. Just now mm -hmm. we talked about sounds and also now, you know, uh, true photography and, and really different forms. So has, have you ever found that, you know, technology has changed the way you make certain decisions about how you record all this kind of data? So whether it's for scientific paper, whether it's for your own kind of exploration. So, you know, how has tech chain affected your data collection process and archiving process over the years? I think uh, tech has done us a great favor. We can now collect information that we could never do before. We could collect information that we could never do at such a scale before. The scale of data collection has increased immensely. Um, I, I, I think nowadays people like to use this word called big data, big data. We just collect so much data that it takes up you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of uh, hard disk space. So, and I think we've got new technology to collect data that we never thought about uh, 20 years ago, for example. Um, in my field uh, and amongst the, my eco ecology, ecology colleagues I work with, um, they now uh, use a lot of uh, drones to collect data from, from the air. Uh, we look at forests from drones. We collect data uh, uh, of animal sounds. Uh, nowadays, there are all these technology we have right now, you know, which allows us to put a, a sound recording device that can collect data for a long time. We just put uh, you just set the, the, the devices to collect data in uh, uh, for a specific time frame and they can do that for a long time. And then for migratory birds, there are some really impressive where we can now put on the bodies of some of the smallest birds around and, and monitor their migration across great distances. You know, at, at 11, 12 gram bird, we can actually study its migration to a high level of detail. So um, we are at the uh, interface uh, of emerging technologies and huge amounts of data. I think it makes us think a lot about how we can, you know, uh, tame that data and bring it to tell us stories about the natural world, yeah. So I think if you go and dig around the literature, you'll find that um, people have more and more interesting and novel ways of collecting data. And of course, different ways of analyzing that data, um, which is giving us a lot of interesting insights about nature and biodiversity that we never thought about. Uh, also, it's also telling us that biodiversity is in great decline. Um, so we need to act on those data. Yeah. Uh, another thing that me and Tingli often talk about is that technology has, because of um, technology, in terms of just basic technology, where digital photography is so easily available for everyone, that there's more and more nature photographers now as in compared to 10 years ago. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, and that's a huge change, I think. And one thing that uh, a lot of these older birders would uh, uh, talk about is that when, when there was vouchers last time, there would just be four or five people interested that uh, in 2006. But today, you will probably get easily 100 and above. Um, and, 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 and all this uh, really means that there are more people out there in Singapore than perhaps in anywhere else of the world looking and trying to spot this. Right, so mm -hmm. so the the chances of um, birds being sighted and population being accounted for is it's just increases. We have more and more data about whatever. It, it seems as if uh, if a rabbit was to fly by Singapore, it is it is almost impossible that it will not be seen because of just so many hungry um, nature photographers that are out there. It seems as if um, we have a kind of a twenty four hour CCTV looking at at, at them. Nature. And if I'm a bird and I want to be famous, I'll just kind of drop by Singapore. Because I'll, I'll be a limelight there. Okay. And um, that being said, I, I think technology in in that sense also has helped a lot of sightings and for us to know actually in, in and 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 I'll, the thing about what I was talking with Tingli was that it seems that there are so many rare sightings in 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 the migratory season this um in in this last few last years, years yeah ten last years ago yeah yeah Simply actually we have more for the I think there are more people looking there are more people observing yeah and you know the more you observe the more you find. Okay, and, and so going back to the Himalayan griffin, so what 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 Ting Li's paper suggested was that due to um, Ting Li, can you explain the kind of the summary of this paper? Well, back in the back in the days, we didn't know why Himalayan griffins are found in Southeast Asia. We show we see them every now and then. I think now they've reached a point where they almost show up in Singapore nearly every other year. Uh, we still don't know why they come here, uh, but I, I then were being a bit speculative. I thought they were, you know, dispersing out to find food after breeding. These vultures live in Tibet. Yeah, that's very far away from here, uh, but they're really good dispersers. They can fly great distances with little effort. Yeah, I don't know if any of you had a, a great opportunity to observe Himalayan vultures in their, in their natural environment. I've seen a lot of these vultures in the Tibetan highlands. They're actually quite common there. You know? They are like roadside birds. In Singapore, you wrote, what the, the common roadside bird is what Javan Minor, right? But in, uh, I arrived in the Tibetan highlands two years ago, drove out of the airport, and right here by the roadside, someone's cow just got knocked down and there was a hundred vultures eating the carcass outside the airport. So I was just struck at how, um, you know, how common they are actually at the, the right places. Yeah. How they got here, I would suggest is probably post green dispersal because a lot of these birds we see of the Himalayan vultures in Singapore, they are uh, young birds based on what we can tell from their physical appearance. And you also mentioned that there could be a possibility of a lack of um, food, maybe, large... yeah large possibility of lack of large prey in, in, his, in his original habitat and also better um, kind of uh, waste disposal, like a dead cow will be immediately disposed of rather than left on the road. So these are kind of uh, urban human factors involved in uh, kind of yeah, yeah. possibly causing vultures to expand out of their native home range. And also maybe to decline at the same time, no? less food, they have to fly further to find food. Um, yeah. And maybe some of them end up here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, On the whole, are we seeing a drop in population, or is it actually a you know the fact that we see more of it doesn't mean there are more of them around, or just yeah. that they've been driven to extreme conditions? I don't think I have an answer to that, but I think we think that this voucher is in decline. Yeah, we think the numbers are dropping from what we know of uh, data collected from the Tibetan Highlands and from Mongolia. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, this is also one of the earliest paper that he did about. Oh, but do you want to tell us about your work also? Uh, the... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to. Oh. So, <laughs> one of the, so, so I often use something, these kind of papers and reasonings and, and things to, to incorporate the kind of reference in my work um, because they kind of, his, his papers kind of is in a kind of, uh, for me, uh, no, not all, but some of his papers kind of feel me with more questions and more mystery than more questions and answers. Uh. Yeah, more questions and answers, which yeah. is what I like, which is what kind of uh, something that I, I, I as an artist would, would like to kind of spark as well to kind of uh, have more questions. Because uh, one thing that we recognize is, uh, or at least I recognize as an artist, is that it's, it's really difficult and it's, 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 it's very, very difficult to kind of work, work with nature and to work with science and, and there are limits in art and limit and, and thinking, I think Tingli agrees also there's limit in science and it's kind of really a struggle. Uh, we, there, there are many perspectives to look at uh, a lot of issues here and, and especially in Singapore where human and nature is kind of almost always in conflict and it's kind of very 
it, it can be very violent because we are high density of people and, and yeah. also certain mammals are kind of on the increase. And so back in 2010, when the wild boar population was just kind of increasing and then we are starting to see uh, wild boar being kind of uh, around neighborhoods. Um, Tingli wrote a paper about kind of this occurrence and, and, and in the summary of the paper, and that he's, he mentions that if this carries on, uh, say uh, the population will increase and you, because they lack a, na a natural predator, yeah, yeah, we would have to can have and, and because Singapore is an island that is of people and animals, yeah, you know, it, it's not just for animals, it's not just for people, it is in the kind of a space where people and animal, uh, people, humans, and non human species collide, yeah, yeah, we, we, in, yeah. And, and in order to for us to um, kind of live on there, there needs to be a kind of a control to the wild world population yeah uh, and, and so i kind of like and, and this is a very very um difficult topic it's a very very complex to topic to talk about because we, we do read in the news that uh, there, there are attacks you know uh, because we we do feed uh, some people feel wild world, which is uh, we shouldn't do that because it changes their behavior and we are starting to see conflicts between uh, human and people in all forms uh, rape jungle fowl. Humans and wildlife. Humans and wildlife. There's yeah. so many examples. And um, and anyway, this is a, a show I did in Sam Singapore Museum, um, uh, during the President Young Talent Show. I, I speak. I, I talk specifically about um, how there are different multiple perspectives to look at the wild ball, and and especially from one that is from Kowloon. So this is a life size uh, wild ball trap, uh, that was in the exhibition. And when you look inside, actually, there are a lot of small holes inside. And it, it looks like, it, it's meant to look something like uh, something that, uh, uh, something so small actually contains something much bigger. So it's just playing with perspectives. Um, and then this is a close-up of a, of a wild ball skin, which I took with a zoom lens. And then it was just after the rain, then you can see kind of wet droplets. But then if you blow up the skin, it suddenly looks like, um, it's, it's like, once again, it looks like something from outer space. It's, it's a... Uh, so what, what I'm kind of trying to say is that there, there, are, there are ways to look at a very narrow problem or narrow, kind of a very, very small problem with kind of bigger perspective to look at the different perspectives um, that, that can involve around the context of the, the wild ball. Uh, and then uh, aliens. Uh, I think he was talking about greater physical, which is growing in population. Yeah. And you, get, you see that more and more now. Um, and I remember when he first saw it, he was very excited. Um, and, and I, and kind of, uh, remember, and then later on, he, he made this little short note where, um, the possibilities of, uh, you know, our rivers are, our waters, reservoirs and drains are full of invasive species, tilapia, what have you not so many species that are not native and, and for the longest time, I think they've enjoyed no predators, right? Not, no major ter um, predators until recently we have um, gray-headed fish eagles and otters maybe yeah and 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 herons, and, and herons herons also getting more common so so um they have an abundance of food here so the uh, increase in white belly fish eagle and gray-headed fish eagle could be also be due to all these um alien species of fish that are in our water so so i find that kind of uh, doubling but where juxtaposition you see one spe yeah. species as undesired but a kind of rare native species is actually making use of it. You know, it doesn't care. It's just food. And another reason why uh, raptors, especially in Singapore, uh, are, are, are on the increase, such as a changeable hot eagle, is uh, another, it could be the rise of uh, albizia trees, Nesting. which is, an, which is an, another alien species of trees, which uh, for a moment we, we were trying to, cut them out from the roadside because they were dangerous. They, they, they break are, easily. Yeah. They, they break easily. They are, they are not from here. They are from the Solomon Islands, but they are one of the fastest growing tree species in the world, uh, which is why we imported them in the first place to kind of have instant fast growing trees about, I think, uh, 1.3 or 1.3 meters a year. Mm. And, um, and they, 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 if you look into our landscape, the tallest tree now is the albedo tree. Yeah, yeah, the tallest trees we all know. It's, it's all, and, and in the Dover forest, in the woodlands forest, they're all albizia trees. And being alien species, they, they kind of have a uh, immediate uh, status where they are not, 
you know, not as important as the primary forest tree. But but actually, these trees, once again, like like the alien fishes, they they support native eagles, which actually need these tall trees to build their nest. So mm. me and Tingli have seen a lot of uh, changeable hot eagles on and white belly fish eagle. Almost always, it was on the Elbizio tree or this large nest. Uh, yeah. so, so I think I think on that point I I, I think the Elbizia tree I didn't I didn't bring that up during my my presentation but I think mm. it's, it's it's great that you raised this because I I think these Elbizia trees are no doubt they are nat uh, not native to this part of the world but um they are present in this uh, urban setting right uh, and how so called native species uh in Singapore are using them I think they present a really interesting case of how native species uh the relationship of native species with invasive species uh, and make us think about these these things in a in a rather more complex fashion. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, a, a lot of things about nature is 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 very complex, and and it's not always that we can harbor in so many views of the increase of greater fish eagle could be due to a lot of alien factors of alien species because it's just not very popular to praise alien species uh, when we are trying to fight very hard for native species. Uh, so so uh, I'm going to. I'm running out of time. I apologize for that. Um, but this is really going to be, I'm just going to quickly go through the last three slides, which is something that happened just before COVID. Um, I, I'm just going to show you this. Is the sound working? Yep. Yes. Loud and clear. Yeah, very good. Okay, so me and Ding Li were just coming back. Um, we just, we, we were in Guangzhou for a project and then we came back and then I was at a friend's house. And then you sent me a lot of frantic messages. Yeah, because I, I was I was having I, yeah. I was having coffee, and then my friend told me, "Oh, there are some stocks, egrets flying out, egress outside my window." Yeah, and then I said, "Oh, it's very common. It's in the evening. They they are flying back to Kranji." He said, "No, but Robert, that's really a lot." And then this was when like I looked out the window, and I was like, I was expecting you know, egrets or herons like six or seven, but then to my I think I could say it was to my horror, I saw thousands uh, outside this Chachukang field. There was thousands of these stocks, and immediately the first person I called uh, was Ting Li, because I knew uh, he would be able to tell me what is going on. So this was on a long get home, and um, there was just thousands and thousands of these open bill stocks, suddenly going round and round in circles. Uh, and, and everyone in the neighborhood started to come out of their balcony. Everyone started, the, all the cars stopped. Everyone stopped, get out of their cars, to at the field. People were rushing to the field. You know, it's, it's just so near. Sometimes they fly outside your, your balcony. And um, you just do not know what is happening. In fact, it looks very nightmarish. It's as if it's a horror film coming alive in front of a typical uh, afternoon in Singapore. And what they are, they are doing here is they're trying to, it's, it's a very small pool of water and they're just trying to stop by it to have a drink. And then when I, I was telling Ting all this, he was telling me, oh, these are, this must be open meal stocks. And uh, they have been coming in the, in the, a few, one month ago. And then I was like, uh, oh, do you know why? Uh, and, and, and subsequently the press picked out on this. And then a lot of people were very amazed with it. And, and some, some, you know, the popular media was saying that, oh, this is a sign that the stocks are saying that we have a high birth rate, you know, in Singapore. You know, that people are being um, kind of... Um, Sending it. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but for me, I, I know there was something urgent. There was something strange that was kind of uh, happening in the landscape. Uh, and you know, I needed somebody to interpret this for me because I no longer can kind of see. And I think, and I feel like all, all the people around me that afternoon, we, we really do not know how to see this. And, and, and for a moment I felt, and I say this a lot of times, I think it was like this shaman. That, yeah, shaman. Yeah, yeah, because this is a spectacle. This is a sign that appeared. And you know, we totally do not have the ability to interpret what on earth or what uh, the earth or nature is trying to tell us. And Tingli immediately told me, oh, this, this must be from around the region, around Thailand. And they are flying off because there's a drought. There's, there's a kind of a long, ongoing, longest drought they have in Thailand. And these birds are very common there. They must be expanding new territories, uh, looking for new places. And, and then Singapore, and then they, uh, not sure how long they've been flying. Um, but over the, the subsequent weeks, uh, you know, different groups were seen around Singapore. 
but but the whole group of thousands of them landing in Get Hong was kind of a, a very rare phenomenon happening. And, and I was just very lucky to friends balcony that day. Um, and 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 so uh, yeah, so so I, I felt that, that there was a there was something our disconnect or 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 of kind of with nature and all this spectacle has, has made us really feel to see the true extent of things that are happening in front of us. Uh, so I'm going to stop here because could I, could Robert, could I add a point to that? I think yeah. it was really good that um, this was happening just when I was in the part of the world where this bird is found in a common commonly and in, in huge numbers. I think I was working in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia uh, at that period. Yeah, and in the, that part of the world, they are very common. I think there was also a year that there were very serious droughts uh, in the region, and I kind of saw a linkage between what we are seeing in Singapore and what was happening in the other parts of Southeast Asia. So I think I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I I I I think as, it's also almost as, as if you're following what happens. Is that right? Like you yeah. see them in a kind of natural original habitat, and then you see them, kind of the effects happening in somewhere on your home turf even. Yeah, I I think the big message that came to me la, I don't know whether if something Robert saw as well, you know, was that uh the biodiversity of Singapore is a part of the biodiversity of Southeast Asia. Uh, we cannot see ourselves as an island. The way we understand and interpret what is biodiversity, what is wildlife doing, we need to think of the bigger picture, and you know how how the animals that we see here, you know, is connected to Malaysia, Thailand, and beyond. Yeah, I think that was the main thing that I think a lot of. About uh, after seeing these things, yeah. Mm. Which which brings us to we have a question. So 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 if you have questions, please just type in type in. We will we'll answer them now. Uh, what are some what have been some of the biggest challenges you have each faced in your work on bird watching and observing nature? And I would say immediately I always think about what if I was not there the afternoon that the open bill stock decided to take try to land in K Hong. You know, I, then I would have never seen it and, and I would have never talked so much about this. I, I've not spent the whole whole week later on trying to chase down these birds around the island, uh, relying on sightings. And, um, and and I think the thing, and, and, and with Ting Li as well, I, I, you know, Ting Li is very obsessed with, with nature and it's very common um, um, before the pandemic happens that on, on Friday night, he's on the plane somewhere and Saturday night, he's already back in Singapore. Uh, just for a bird sighting and he would have almost spent 48 hours for 30 minutes of bird watching and that, that is how <laughs> huge carbon footprint you know no but it's regional it's for work and, and, and that's with high carbon footprint maybe you should stop doing that um, so um, and I, I think what I'm trying to say as, at, at least for what I observe is that nature is, is not something that uh, you can predict and it's not something, and you have to have patience. Um, and it was always kind of, um, for, for me, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is waiting for the right stories to fall into place and to kind of, uh, you know. So, so there, Dingy, do you want to answer that? I, I fully agree with what you mentioned, Jan, that how, you know, how sometimes being at the right place at the right time, you can get to observe something that you would never have done if you were there, let's say, one hour before or one hour after. I think the realization of how, you know, uh, passing these observations are, I think, really is uh, uh, quite compelling in, because it affects the way we develop these narratives about nature. Yeah. And then, of course, from the, as a scientist, um, as a researcher, um, as a, as a, mainly a researcher and an occasional uh, illustrator, you know, we, I, 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 we do face big challenges in how we observe nature. Um, I think from the environmental point of view, I feel that nature is changing uh, very quickly uh, at the regional scale, you know, around Southeast Asia. A lot of things, a lot of ecosystems, a lot of habitat, a lot of forests, a lot of wetlands are becoming uh, are in, in decline. So it's becoming more and more for us, difficult for us to visit such areas to collect observations. Um, and we are, I, I see myself rushing to places to see places before they are gone. Um, I think that that is one of the big challenges I feel in terms of um, the changing nature of the fact of how we observe biodiversity and wildlife. Yeah. Places are going at a very fast pace. And uh, we may not be able to observe things if we delay a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, I reflect and on the many I'm places. Aware that, of, yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. 
Sorry, Daryl. Oh, no, I was just going to add uh, that we do have one question from Benjamin. So I just wanted to kind of bring it up so we, we can talk about it. And again, I'm just aware of the time. So mm. uh, yeah, Benjamin, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, um, you can unmute yourself now and just ask a question. Are you there? Oh, if not, you can just type it out and then, okay, when, when the question kind of pops out, then we'll just kind of address that along the way. Uh, somebody asked me if my works are fictional or factual. Uh, I think uh, that's a, my, my, my works are kind of a sit in between, because of the way I present my work as it, it's within the Institute of Critical Zoologists, which is in itself a, a fictional organization. But uh, what I do is um, I work with a lot of facts and a lot of scientists to create. And, and I think I will see my work as stories and stories to tell specific viewpoints. So they are kind of a blur between fictional and factual. And, and what I hope really is that the, the works do not stop at being works, but they prompt deeper kind of research or thinking or on the part of the audience to kind of seek out more to the stories. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's where uh, my work stands. I hope that answers. Uh, your question. Robert, are you going to talk about the Christmas Island work that you did uh, with the researchers there? Yeah, next week, next talk, you're covering that, right? No, because the one I, I didn't do it with you. Ma. So next oh. week, I'll do, I'll do the Guangzhou okay, the, the, and the, the Yalujiang. Guangzhou and Yalujiang. Okay, the Guangzhou and the Yalujiang, well, that should cover a lot of uh, ground. So uh, uh, Ben, can we, do you, man, do you manage to type in the, the questions? I think we've tackled up. We've done all the questions. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. I just want to add, like, and, and Robert, the thing you said about, um, I mean, the, the stories that you captured. So that was, uh, interestingly, that was something how I met Robert, I think about 10, more than 10 years ago right now. So, was, you know, at that point in time, I was exploring a lot of work that involved nature. And then someone recommended and told me, oh, you have to speak to Robert. You know, he's a wildlife photographer. And I think to my great pleasure, I found out he's, he's so much more than that. He's, he's really a storyteller of nature. So what he said about, you know, Tingli being the shaman, right? Kind of making sense of the natural world. I think I, I see Robert as the counterpoint or almost the complementary form to that and, and really helping us make sense of how, how we feel about nature, how we, how we kind of um, internalize all these thoughts. So, you know, this conversation has just been, just been so great. And uh, I, I, okay, so I think timing-wise, I, I will just kind of round, round this off right now. I just want to uh, wait, wait, thank- Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Oh, you have something else to add first? Yeah, Go I think it's that. very important to add that the number of, the, the, during the parrot count, where we were looking at a few hundred parrots uh, in this neighborhood, um, it, because the way we talk about it is like this very fantastic phenomenon that is great for bird watchers. But I want to say a bit about the truth on the background is that I, for sure some of the neighbors are very irritated. People will live around those areas. Yeah, it is every for day they sure. have to live all the sound. Yeah. Yeah, because imagine every evening and every morning you are, you have a few hundred parrots around you um, for the rest of your lives. Uh, or for a long time lah. And there's something long I'm time. sure they didn't know when they got the place, right? It's, it's kind of like <laughs> yeah, and, and then you worry about effect. you know now 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 we are a bit more worried about hygiene and cleanliness. And, and, and we worry about diseases and viruses and, and, and we worry about a lot about things that we do not know of. And, and this parrots in the hundreds cannot be a thing that we are sure of what's happening. And, and with the parrots, they're actually very near um, minor roofs and crow roofs. Birds form these roofs around neighborhoods, specific neighborhood points. And once again, Tingli has, doesn't know why, but um, I can speculate with, based on my conversations with him is that um, the urban heat that is so, that's a bit far from the forest, but not too far. And just the right amount of wind pr produce a good temperature for these birds to roost. So they do not roost anywhere, anyhow. And it's definitely not dependent on the tree species. It's really dependent on the landscape, the architecture there, uh, the breeze that, was, that has, is blowing that year. Landscape setting. Last the year. landscape setting the, the and the climate. Yeah. And, and the weather, you know, and, and the cars and everything. This has a great influence on, on where these birds decide to lose and it has great impact on the residents uh, around them. And, and in fact, on several occasions, I have seen very, uh, I've seen a lot of passerbys trying to shoo these birds uh, away 
mm. and and other things just to make sure that the birds are not there because uh, you know the, the birds were never meant uh, that our neighbors were never meant to have 500 parrots coming to lose every evening so so this is just a kind of uh, something to add on to our very beautiful sighting of 100 birds yeah okay so uh, there we can wrap it up Thanks for the thanks for the final point there. So, uh, you know, just just to kind of like rehash some of the, the points you spoke about, um, hearing from Robert, hearing from Ping Lee. So, is that really that nature has been changing extremely quickly, and that you know, uh, again to link it back to the murals, that what we want to do is the capturing, uh, to capture certain stories, certain histories, and also you know certain uh, is is really a slice in time of what we see you know what we kind of talk about uh, what we see in, in kind of the, the areas surrounding sam but also as a, a larger kind of representation of what we see in singapore our the state of nature the state of our interaction and where we are at mm -hmm. so um i think this is something that you know we we witness in robert's work and thing work both from different perspectives and I, I love that you know we had the chance to talk about this so once again you know this is part one of our art and science uh branch of the, the conversations on conservation that we've got and I uh, just want to just talk about the next two so uh, uh, Singly will be uh, hosting the next two sessions uh, exploring culture exploring architecture and heritage which is on the which will be on the 17th of April and also on the 29th of May so you can scan the QR code here for a bit more information so once again you know we, we will still be here for a few more minutes if there are more questions or you know we just carry on the conversation anyway and I just want to thank um Sam for you know supporting the work for presenting this this uh, mural and giving us a chance to yeah, have these kind of wonderful conversations and to share them with everyone over here. So can I interrupt uh, you for a second? Yes, I think um, I just want to have a sh sh I mean sh a quick shout out to the audience that those of you who've actually not seen the mural to actually go and have a look at it. Yeah, and I, this is the funny part. A friend just texted me and said that I'm now at Daryl's mural. Where is your talk happening? Uh, so. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, but anyway, he says that he really uh, enjoys, uh, he's now there looking at the mural, like, because he realized that the talk is not a physical event, it's actually, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, so yeah. maybe it will be extra clear for the next one that's coming up, or maybe we shall film it there at the mural itself. So. We could well do that, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for, for the wonderful audience who join, who have joined us on this Saturday morning. Thank you to Ting Lee for sharing, you know, all your work and all, all the great work that you've been doing for the many, many years. And for Robert for asking some amazing questions and, and then taking over my role effectively. But at the same time, you know, for, for sharing his work that, that really that captures the stories of Singapore, of the, the state of nature, of this interaction between uh, man and nature.